All right, chapter 6. And before I jump off on chapter 6, I had mentioned on chapter 5 uh, the um, stuff about doing the T-test. Am I on the screen there? All right, good. Um, the, uh, that uh, I was working on a paper right now, and I was going to show you my results. And so here they are. Uh, I may bring this up again later because it brings up a couple other points that we haven't covered yet. But here are my regression results. Now, that's three different equations. On each of the three of them, it's trying to explain investment. And actually, strictly speaking, it's trying to explain, I don't know if I've left myself enough room to draw that here. Yeah, I did. Strictly speaking, it's the change in investment from one uh, quarter to the next, which is much more difficult to explain for reasons we'll talk about later than just investment, which is why the adjusted R squares are not like 0.9 and instead are like 0.17 and so forth. Um, the T-scores are in parentheses underneath. I'm sorry, let me, let me finish what I was saying earlier. Uh, that's, that's three different equations. One, and I'm not going to explain all the variables because it takes a long time to explain them. I'll explain two of them. Um, the first one is, uh, and the first equation includes FOR, SUR, PK, and R. The second equation includes FOR, SUR2, and PK, and R. And the third one includes all of them, all right? So, and the idea there was, as we'll talk about here, actually in this upcoming chapter, I didn't know which of those two SUR variables was represented in surprise. Surprise results to the entrepreneur about uh, whether actual profits were higher or lower than they had expected them to be, all right? So these are surprises. FOR is the forecast of what they thought profits were going to be. But on top of what they thought profits were going to be, it's also important uh, any surprises that took place during that quarter. So that's what those two variables are, and I'm, those two SUR variables. And I measured it two different ways, and I couldn't come up with a theoretical reason of why one was better than the other. So the most honest thing to do is to report both of them and say, hey, I tried it all three of these ways. Uh, and you make up your own mind. I want, I want to show you everything I did. Uh, again, we're going to do this at the end of this chapter here, talk wh about why this is important. Uh, but uh, I didn't like try everything a thousand times and then say, hey, this one works, and then report just that one. To be an honest, ethical econometrician, you need to report, and I want to say every single thing you did, but uh, a, a significant subset thereof. All right, so anyway, there's, there's those uh, different equations. Let's still look at just the bottom one, all right, that includes all of them. Uh, and 6.4 is the T-score on that FOR variable that's going to tell us whether or not it's statistically significant. Okay, let's have a look at the table here in the book and see where 6.4 is going to show up. Well, I'm using the 10% level, one-sided, so that's that very first column, for crying out loud, six is going to be bigger than three, all right? So uh, it's going to pass a, a t-test at any level, all right? Six is an extremely high t-score, which is why I was so excited about my results. Uh, 3.49, what was the, what was the, 3.078 was the hardest, I'm sorry, wrong way, hardest it was going to be to prove my point uh, in this um, uh Regression. That is the highest critical T value on the uh, on the table for a one-sided 10% test. And of course, why one-sided? I hypothesized a sign for each of these variables. I hypothesized that FOR, SUR, and SUR2 were all going to be positive. So they were positive. If they'd been negative, it doesn't matter whether that T-score had been 12 million, it's still not significant because it was the wrong sign. You've got to be the right sign, and then the T-score has to be bigger uh, in absolute value than the critical T-value. 3.49 passes. 261 is now getting close, right? 261. Um, so I'm going to look on the table. So if I only had one degree of freedom, it's not going to pass. But it will with two. And in fact, I had over 120. 120 is the last one listed on here, uh, 1.289. I had over 120. So uh, it's going to be at least uh, as small as 1.289. And with that in mind, let's look at the others. 1.289 is going to be the uh, uh, standard here. All of them beat that. Uh, and I should tell you, PK is the price of capital equipment. So this is what it's going to cost the entrepreneur to build a new factory or whatever. And that variable is negative, as I assumed it would be. 
uh, and 1.52 is the uh, um, T-score. And then the last one's the interest rate, which we also are going to assume is going to be negative. As interest rates go up, so firms find it more expensive to borrow, so they don't invest as much, but it's 1.71. So nowhere on there do we see a T-score that is less than the 1.71. One point two eight nine. That is, must be. You know, that's at one hundred and twenty degrees of freedom. And as you have more degrees of freedom, so the t, the critical t value gets smaller. I had more than one hundred and twenty. So one point two eight nine is certainly an overestimate of how large the critical t was going to be, and it beat all of those, which is why I was really excited about the paper. Um, and still wait. Uh, I sent it out what two months ago, something like that. Uh, it, it, it's, um, you know the feeling when you get a paper back in class? That's the way we feel, all right? So, uh, and you know, there's always criticisms. And the first thing that I always think is like, well, you stupid jerk, that's not true. And then when you think about it, well, yeah, I guess you're right. I guess I better change that. So anyway, we'll see how that works out. Okay, so that was really a, 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 a follow-up from chapter five, but it also brought up some things that are gonna come up in this chapter as well. Now, this is a fantastic chapter, this chapter six. And I, there, we're going to talk about choosing which independent variables to include, which of course is exactly what I was telling you about right here. Trying to decide what should I include in my regression? Which variable should I include? And there's two errors you can make, right? You can omit something that you should have included. Oops, I just misspelled irrelevant. Or you can include something you shouldn't have, all right? So those are the only two errors, right? You could, you could leave something out that you should have put in, or you could put something in that you shouldn't have. And what we're gonna say here, ultimately, is that this turns out to be the bigger problem. You should try to avoid this. Uh, there are several reasons why you should try to avoid it, but uh, this one turns out to be the bigger problem. Now, I need to emphasize something first uh, about econometrics in general, and that is you have to remember, and I, and I find uh, in teaching econometrics that this is one of the hardest things to get across because we have been dealing with this differently in every other economics course, all right? Uh, for example, Let's say we're talking about quantity demanded of some good or service, right? So I'm gonna back into the point I was gonna to try to make here. Quantity demanded is a function of the price of that good or service and your income. And then a bunch of other stuff, all right? So in, econ in an economics class, you might, in fact, let's do this actually. Let's just say quantity demanded is a function of price. And there's your demand curve, all right? Does, do other things affect the quantity demanded? Of course they do. Income, price of substitutes, price of complements, tastes, regulations, on and on and on, right? But in a micro class, we might say, well, let's ignore all those right now, uh, and let's just talk about the, price, the, the, the uh, uh, impact of price. Let's hold everything else constant. Let's discuss price while holding everything else constant. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll bring those in maybe one at a time uh, in a later lecture. The real world won't hold everything else constant. The real world insists that you include all of the variables all the time. Econometrics requires that you include all of the variables all the time. And, and, and here's the reason. And it's very important to remember that. And again, it, it's against what we've told you in other classes or, or what we sort of implied. And that is, well, let's just hold everything else constant. Let's ignore the impact of the price of complements and the price of substitutes and so forth. The real world won't ignore them. Quantity demanded, price, price of substitutes, price of complements, income. Let, let's say that, that that completely describes the demand for goods and services. And we're doing an econometric study here. And we have data for all these, right? You know, 
14, 7, uh, 6, uh, 13, 200, you know. All right. Um, we've got all these data for, we found data for the quantity of, of butter demanded. Let's do butter. Very common economics example here. Butter, uh, here's the price of butter, of course. Substitute, that's the price of margarine. Complement, toast is the complement for butter. Uh, income, obviously, is just income. All right, so, so we, we've collected all these data. Now, check this out. You say to yourself, well, I'm not really interested in the impact of anything in this study, except for, I'm really curious, just about that. I'm really curious about how the price, changing price of, of margarine affects the quantity of butter demanded. So, you say foolishly, I'm going to run this regression. Quantity demanded is equal to beta sub zero plus beta sub one. We'll do this over time. Uh, price of substitutes. All right. Price of substitute. I'm just going to run that. You know why that's a huge problem? Because these data are from the real world. These data were absolutely affected by this and this and this. Whether you put them in the regression or not, they're still affected by this and this and this. These data in this column over here are real world numbers for how much people demanded of, 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 of butter. And for them, the price of butter mattered. The price of toast mattered. Their income mattered, all right? Just because the only thing you're interested in is the price of margarine doesn't mean you can leave everything else out. Now, it does in the classroom, when we're in a micro class. In a micro class, we can talk about, well, let's just think by itself the impact of a change in the price of margarine. Theoretically, we can do that. We can ignore all the other variables, and we do that all the time, and for a very good reason. But the problem is that when we get around to this, it becomes, it becomes difficult for students to break that, that habit of thinking, okay, okay, I've got these data. No, really, the variable I'm really curious about is really just this one, so I'm only going to include that. That would be an incorrectly specified regression that had omitted variable bias. You've omitted this one, this one, and this one. It doesn't matter if the only one you're interested in is this one. And as a matter of fact, going back to that paper I was showing you here, um, this was a test of, that's upside down. This was a test of Keynes's description of what causes investment in chapter 22 of the general theory. I think so. Um, and honestly, I was really only interested in FOR, SUR, and SUR2. All right, those are the ones that were the really big deal that was unique about what Keynes said. And I went to a lot of trouble to create these variables from other data. PK and R, you know, R is a very common view of, of, being, the, of being the most important determinant of uh, people who are detractors of Keynes. So in some ways, well, why are you going to include R? That, that's not something that, you know, Keynes is saying is important. Uh, you got to include everything. You got to include everything that really did affect real world investment. I got to include P, sub, uh, PK. I got to include R. Even though I'm really only curious about FOR, SUR, and SURT, but I've got to include the others. If I want to truly understand how much of this was being caused by FOR, I have to include the other stuff. Because then, now I can tell independent of the other variables what the impact of FOR was. And I cannot tell you what the units of measure were now because I don't remember. But for every one unit increase in FOR, investment increased by, what is that? I can't read it from here. Uh, 28. 28? 20? Yeah, 28. All right. For every one, and again, I'm sticking with the bottom equation, um, with the one with all the variables. Uh, for every one unit increase in FOR, there was a 28 unit increase in investment. Actually, I think 28 increase in change in investment, but uh, nevertheless. Um, and, but I, I could not tell that if I had left out all the other variables, if I hadn't tried to take into account the effect of the other variables. So, once again, I'm only interested in this. Well, you know what? To really and truly find out the unique impact of this, 
you must include the others so that the computer can take into account, oh, okay, wait a minute, I see. Some of that 14 was being determined by this. Some of it was being determined by this. Some by this. But what was left over was determined by this. Right? So you have to include all the variables that you think are important, even when you're only interested in a subset of them. Otherwise, you don't really know what the subset cost. Because you are... Oh, I tell students this a lot during econometrics. I think I already did this in an earlier video. The computer is like a puppy. The computer trusts you. The computer believes you. If you pretend to throw a ball, the computer will go after it, okay? If you run a regression with QD and PS, the computer's gonna be like, well, I guess that's all that's important. Okay, so I'm gonna attribute all of the fluctuation in QD to just PS, because you told me that was the right thing to do, all right? That's really cruel to do to a computer. Um, whereas when you put all the variables in, then the computer's like, ah, QD was determined by all four of these, and now I can differentiate. Now I can tell you how much of 14 was caused by this. But I can't tell you that if you don't include the other variables. So, very, very important point that is key in understanding omitted variable bias is that you can't hold everything else constant unless you put everything else in, all right? Once you put everything else in, then you can have some reasonable confidence that what the computer gave you uh, was just the impact of just that variable. Going back to this again, um, only by including all of those variables, uh, again, we'll just deal with, with the bottom equation. In fact, perhaps let's just do this. So that we're only looking at the bottom equation and you don't get confused by that. All right. Um, the only by including all five of those can I have any confidence about the individual coefficients truly being related to just that phenomenon. Uh, truly being related to just interest rates, to just the price of capital and so forth, right? You have to include all the relevant variables or the computer will attribute to the variables you included things that were actually caused by variables you excluded. All right, so that's a long, that was one line on my notes, right? That was the, the one that's in all uh, caps and bolded there. Uh, that took a long time, but it's very important because if you don't get that in your head, then the rest of the chapter isn't going to make sense. And it's a very useful chapter, very interesting chapter. This has not been ironed. We're still under COVID-19 quarantine. Uh, I haven't used the iron in a while. Um, I did the other day because TCU Admissions asked if I would speak to uh, potential incoming uh, TCU Econ majors, uh, and I ironed a shirt for that. I thought that would be the right thing to do. Okay, let's see. Let me give you an example here of, of exactly how, I shouldn't say exactly, of roughly how the computer would react if you included, uh, if you ran an improperly specified regression. Let us say that the true equation, that the right equation is grade sub i is equal to b, beta sub zero plus beta sub one hours of study, uh oh, am I going to run out of space? Plus beta sub two, yeah, crap. As I mentioned in an earlier video, I am Reluctant to write right here. I guess you can kind of see through it, but it's cracked right there. I wish that had not happened. Uh, okay, let me do it again right here. Grade sub i is equal to beta sub zero plus beta sub one hours of study plus beta sub two. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Attendance. Okay, so you've collected data on students in all TCU intro micro classes, right? And uh, you know what their grades were, uh, let's say for this semester. So we, and then we have the hours of study they studied for the entire semester, and then their attendance for the entire semester, all right? So, so this is, let, let's say that this is the actual true right specification, but you ran this instead. equals beta sub zero, and I believe I'm going to change from the example I have in my notes and do it this way instead. Ah, uh, no, no, I'm, well, ee, I don't know if I should change it or not. Hang on. I don't know that hours. I'm going to leave one of them out, and in my notes I left out attendance, but now I'm tempted to leave out hours. 
Um, I'm going to do it that way. Yeah. I'm going to do it uh, this way instead, the way I don't have it in my notes. You believe that's the true regression. You think that grades are... To, oh, no, let's word it this way. Let's say, yeah, but I'm only really interested in the impact of attendance. So I'm only going to include attendance in the regression. Well, you can't do that, right? Because the grades were also determined by how many hours people studied. And I feel very strongly, although I have no empirical evidence on this, that those two move together. That people who attend class more also study more. And people who attend class less also study less. So they move together. So... You're going to run this regression, you're going to have a pretty good result. Uh, this regression right here. It's not going to tell you you made a mistake. It's going to tell you, uh, oh yeah, oh, that, that, that's really a good point there because it turns out that I have a very significant variable here. Um, and you're going to think, oh my God, I'm a genius. When in fact what you've got is omitted variable bias. The problem is going to be that since these two variables move together, What you're picking up is not only the impact of attendance, but also the impact of a hidden variable that should have been included, and that was hours of study, because the grade really was determined by both. Remember, we're assuming that this blue equation here is the absolute right one. You asked God, and God said, oh, that's the right one. All right, so um, what actually determined people's grades? how long they studied, and whether or not they showed up for class. Because then that means that when they do study, uh, they have a better sense of what the material was. They haven't got to go back and reread re the book because they weren't there that day or whatever. That's more quality studying from attendance. Uh, so it was determined by both of these, right? Determined by both of these, but you only included attendance. So even though this was determined by, by both, you told the computer, explain the complete and total variation of grade using only attendance. Well, it will, because it's a puppy, and it thinks that you know what you're doing. It worships you, and so it figures it out. Only what ends up happening is that this red beta sub 2 ends up being a lot bigger than the blue beta sub 2, which is the true beta sub 2 in the regression that was properly specified. I'm going to make up a number here. Let's say that um, for, uh, how are we going to do that? Uh, let's see, attendance as a percentage. I mean, it doesn't make that much difference, but yeah, let's do it as a percentage, where it's a 1 for 100% attendance, it's a 0.5 for uh, you attended half the classes, all right? So this becomes a number like uh, 50, okay? Uh, that for every day you attended, you, uh, I'm sorry, uh, if you had perfect attendance, that tended to raise your grade by 50 points. If you had showed up for half the class periods, that raised your grade by uh, 25 points. All right, so let's say that that's the uh, actual number. Well, guess what it's going to give you down here in beta sub 2? A number bigger than 50. Because whatever was being reflected under hours, you have now forced beta sub 2 to explain everything. All right, including the stuff that was really explained by this. So you're going to get a number bigger than 50, but here's the really crappy part. You're going to get a really good T-score and a really good adjusted R square. And you're gonna think, whoa, I'm some kind of genius. The, one of the problems with omitted variable bias is that it is very hard to tell that you made the mistake. Because when other variables have to take up the slack, it is quite possible that they can do so easily. All right, in, in this case right here, because these vary together, when attendance went up, actually that person's hours of study went up too, but you didn't reflect that. So, and the computer is trying to explain all the variation of this with just this, it's going to make beta sub 2 bigger than it really is in real life. All right? So that's called omitted variable bias. When you omit a variable, the remaining betas are biased because they are forced to take into account fluctuations in the dependent variable that they didn't cause. All right? So, and, and it doesn't, the computer doesn't know the theory. All right? So the computer can't pick and choose. The computer assumes you know what you're doing. All right? So uh, it, you told it to explain all of the fluctuations in grade using just this? It did. It explained all the fluctuations in grade with just that. All right? So, uh, and again, the problem is that it's very unlikely that you would even notice because you would run this and like, cool, it worked great. And that is why, and this is a, what, one of the reasons that makes this book so great. Uh, what color do I want to use to make this important point? All right.
theory, theory, theory is extremely important. You have to have sat here and done, and let me go back to an earlier chapter here and I'll show you what I'm talking about. We've already gone over this. Uh, but um, you, you have to make sure that you've done the theoretical background properly. Uh, let's see, I believe that was, yeah, chapter three. Chapter three, step one. Review literature and develop theoretical model. That is absolutely critical. Uh, you have to do that very carefully. Uh, remember I told you during that chapter there that I was a, a, an outside member of a, a student's honors thesis committee and he had done the econometric thing. There was no theory section. I was like, yeah, and I wasn't in charge of the whole thing, so I try to be a little bit, um, uh, you know, sort of defer to the person that is in charge. But I was like, there kind of has to be a theory section. You kind of have to say, why did you pick these variables? That actually is critical. And he did add it back in, so that was done. All right, so, so the problem is going to be here that omitted variable bias is very difficult to notice which means you have to have done your homework properly in terms of figuring out what should I, uh, theoretically, what makes sense here. Now, in my model here, oh, where is it? There it is. I'll tell you something that made it easy for me. Come on, focus, there we go. What made it easy for me is that I was not trying to figure out what caused investment myself. I was only picking variable, I was testing Keynes' theory. I was testing Keynes' theory, and Keynes included those variables right there. So I didn't have to pick and choose. I mean, I had to, uh, in the article itself, I've got the justified, I've got the side stuff from Keynes and saying, okay, this is what he says causes investment. But that's why I included those. If it were entirely up to me and I was doing John Harvey's theory of investment, I might include some different variables from some other theories, but I was only testing Keynes's theory. Uh, but remember, the only variables I was truly interested in were those first three. Why did I include the two that Keynes said? Eh, those are sort of minor effects. They may have an effect, but they're minor. Um, because he said they include, he said to include them. So I want to make sure that FOR and SUR and SUR2 are really, that those coefficients are showing the impact of those variables and not also taking into account what PK and R did. I had to include PK and R if I wanted to make sure I knew what the included variables were actually representing. Uh, let's see. That is why I think, okay, okay, okay. There is one situation in which um, it can be clear that you made omitted variable bias. Uh, and, or, or I'm sorry, I, I should say, uh, that could suggest to you that you have omitted variable bias. And, and let me stop the video here at 27 minutes, almost 28, and, and uh, start up on, the, I don't want to get partway through this one. I'm trying to do this in half hour chunks. So hang on just a second.